So my name is Daniel Besser. I'm the managing director of the German Stem Cell Network and also the chair of the Dialogue platform uh, at the BIH uh, for stem cell research. This BI lecture will be by Simone Spuler, who works at the ECRC. Um, uh, she studied medicine in Würzburg um, after a stint in California at UCSD in San Diego. Um, she went back to Munich, then she had another stay in the States at the Mayo Clinic, and afterwards she came to the Charité, where she now heads the muscle research unit here at the, um, here outside in Berlin Buch. Um, I think Simone is really a, a, a very, very good example for inspiring women in translational medicine. And there is a BIH video which you can check out on her website. And I think she really makes a very strong point as a clinical scientist for the research to clinical development, which is at the core of what the BIH is doing. So without further ado, I would like to give you the presentation by Simona with the um, title, Gene Editing Human Muscle Stem Cells as Advanced Therapies. Simona, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Daniel, for this very kind introduction. Thank you for this invitation to give this, um, to give this lecture at this um, really wonderful opportunity. So the topic of today's talk is the gene-edited human muscle stem cell as an advanced therapy. I would like to start with a couple of sentences about where we are. So this is the, um, the muscle research unit and we belong to the Charité with a large outpatient clinic where we care for two and a half thousand patients with all kinds of um, muscle disorders and we do diagnosis and follow-up as well as supportive care. And um, we are very interested in bringing the latest scientific findings into clinical trials. Uh, we have a basic research group um, within, within our little division, and we are interested in human muscle stem cells and ATMPs, muscular dystrophy and gene editing. I will talk about this, obviously. We had big help, large help from the BIH, and thank you for this. Um, without, without the support and the translational um, 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 focus of the BIH, um, I wouldn't be able to give the talk in a way I'm doing today. Um, but the DFG and the BMBF and, Hel and Helmholtz, as well as private initiatives, also have been um, absolutely important in, in supporting us. So with muscular dystrophies, we are talking about 50 different monogenic progressive disorders, and um, these are severe diseases. There is an overall incidence of about 30 of 100 in, in 100,000, and um, until today there is no treatment, but I think this is going to change quite soon. What is happening to the patient um, when the patients are usually in, in childhood, in rare cases also um, in, in young adulthoods, um, the, the, the patients realize that they um, cannot, cannot compete anymore in sport, that they stop running, that they go on tiptoes, that uh, contractures in the, in the um, Achilles tendons occur. And um, these diseases are quite progressive. And the patient I'm, I'm showing here, as you can see that he's um, um, sitting in a wheelchair that the hands and the lower arms are atrophied. Obviously, he is also on a respirator. So the muscular dystrophies, um, they affect all, can affect all muscles, including the heart. Um, isn't necessarily, um, it's not always the case, but um, it may also involve um, the heart muscle. And what happens to the muscle when you take when you take um, a muscle biopsy specimen and you look at it? Then in the in, on the left you have an example of an intact muscle on a cross section. You can see that each muscle fiber has about the same size and and looks very even. And in in muscular dystrophy, what is happening to the muscle is that. Um, over time, the muscle fibers get replaced by, by fat and by connective tissue. And once this process is too far advanced, it's of course obviously very difficult to interfere. So the, the, um, the first aim when we think about treating muscular dystrophies is to, to catch the disease as early as possible, meaning that you have to come up with a good diagnosis as early as possible and not to wait until this muscle has, has developed in something as I'm showing here on the right. 
okay, it is the right time to develop these therapies. Why is that? So we had, um, we have um, very prominent reviews and publications again on the on the subject of stem cell therapies for muscular dystrophies. This is a very recent review from a Stanford group um, published in the in the JCI. And at the same time, we see that um, AAV, um, the adeno-associated virus, which has been used in, in um, gene therapy attempts um, for, for 25 years, um, still is, is a very, is quite a dangerous target. And um, again, last year, there have been um, three deaths in a, in a clinical trial also involving a muscular dystrophy. So so um, then, with the with the Nobel Prize for for Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Doudna, um, and the the um, finding of the CRISPR Cas, um, it's really a time changer, and the door has opened to develop therapies for these um, devastating disorders. But now let's travel back in time a little bit. Um, exactly six, 60 years ago, there was Alexander Moro was actually a cardiologist involved in cardiac pacemaker development but at night he got a little bored and so he he studied rabbit muscle and he found that there was a very peculiar cell at the edge of 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 skeletal muscle and he wrote in his very first paragraph in his um in his paper when he described this this cell type he he wrote that the cell type could be of interest to students for muscle histology but furthermore as we shall suggest might be pertinent to the vexing problem of skeletal muscle regeneration and he suggests that this small cell at the edge of skeletal muscle, which he calls because of, his, of the anatomical location satellite cell, that this cell might be responsible for skeletal muscle regeneration. And up until today, this has not been possible to prove this clinically, that these cells can be used for therapy. Okay, the satellite cell um, is uh, uh, consists of only 4% of all the nuclei in the multi multinucleated skeletal muscle fiber. Here I'm in this in this um, cartoon, I'm showing the cell in green. So the location is a bit different from the regular myonucleus. It's located between the basal lamina and the sarcolemma. And as I said, about 4% of the nuclei of skeletal muscle are satellite cell. So they are cars and in early childhood they may may be about eight percent and when you are 80 it may be only two percent but it never it never never gets more and the satellite cells also never completely disappear um, when you isolate these satellite cells and put them in culture you can expand them to a certain extent but very very early on they start to become old and senescent and they don't really like to grow anymore and then when they come too close to each other they fuse to myotubes eventually later to fibers but um, the satellite cells are very very difficult to keep in an in a very early stage however after the satellite cell was found and it was only only um, assumed that the satellite cell could be useful for regenerating muscle for therapy um, the um, scientists tried to do so and here in Terry Partridge <clears throat> and Kunkel's um, nature paper from 1989 raised all the hope that um, these cells might be usable for for treating uh, muscular dystrophies and here they show that there is a conversion of dystrophin negative um, cells by transplanting health cells into mice and immediately everybody was so excited about this and here we are talking about the mid 90s so 25 years ago um, that they isolated cells from the from the muscle fiber from healthy individuals and they transplanted these cells into into boys that um, were diagnosed with Duchenne's muscular dystrophy and although this had worked in mice quite nicely this um, this clinical trial <clears throat> failed and really put a lot of damage to the field of, of um, primary human muscle stem cells in as a, as a therapeutic um, attempt. 
And what happened in the next years um, was that people said, "Naja, but but still, it's probably important to use cells for the treatment. We shouldn't leave this this entire subject out of our uh, out of our minds." And they tried to characterize other cells, alternative cells, um, with the hope that they would also be able to make muscle and to replace the satellite cells that have been thought to be useless for, for, for treatment purposes. And so there were misangioblasts and parasites and CD133 cells and the IPS cells that you are probably all very well aware of and another cell type which is called PW1 interstitial cells. And all of these cells have some myogenic potential. Um, however, it took until 2011 until it finally became clear that muscle regeneration just does not happen when there are no satellite cells. So all the other cell types that had been had been um, um, published and and um, shown to be in some in some way useful for muscle regeneration, they had bystander effects and um, they also contribute to muscle, but if there are no satellite cells, muscle will not re regenerate and these three independent publications showed this and since then it has been shown many, many times. And um, it, it becomes obvious that the time when the first clinical trial was done in the mid 90s, the molecular properties of the cells and the characterization um, of the cells were just at the beginning or almost not existent. And here this, this, um, this picture shows you the molecular properties that have been, character, uh, have been shown to be, to be um, characteristic for a satellite cell. You have quite a few surface markers here, but of these surface markers, none of them is very specific or solely specific for a satellite cell. And here, in, here are the transcription factors, the myogenic transcription factors that characterize satellite cells and among those the PAC7 um, um, the PAC7 transcription factor is probably the one that best characterizes the satellite cell in its niche. And it's also known now that the satellite cell is a true stem cell, meaning that in cell division there is, um, there is contribution to building new myofibers as well as repopulating the satellite cell niche by asymmetric division. Um, okay, so we can we can say that muscle regeneration depends on satellite cells, and it has also become clear that only these very early cells, the satellites, the muscle stem cell, and the very early myoblasts, that they have regenerative potential. But the late and senescent cells that have have vacuoles and don't really like to grow anymore, they have no regenerative potential. Um, but um, nobody has really seen the cells that were transplanted in the 90s. But it may well be that these cells were at a very late differentiation state. So we thought after this all was known and, the, and these, these um, important um, findings were done in, in, in mouse models, whether it might be worthwhile to have another look at human PAC7 positive satellite cells and whether we can, we can sort of modify purification and cultivation protocols to see whether we can get a handle on them and, and just be able to purify the early cells. Um, so we we um, we took uh, the muscle biopsies after informed consent from the patients, of course. The muscle biopsies are quite small, so here it's it's five millimeters in cubic. And we decided, in contrary to all the purification protocols, that it might be a good idea not to do an enzymatic digest of the tissue because this could lead to an early activation of the cell and meaning that the cell will also very soon lose um, a potential to regenerate muscle. And um, so we, we did some manual dissection and we saw that after a week in culture, happy satellite cells were traveling up and down the muscle fiber and um, appear, appeared to be quite, quite intact. And then when we waited a little bit, then we saw that the PAC7 positive cells, so the early satellite cells or muscle stem cells, that they um, had, had proliferated within this, um, this fiber fragment that we, that we had dissected. And um, this was a very nice finding. So then we waited for a little bit longer and we found that the cells outgrew the fiber eventually and we had millions and millions of, of um, nice myogenic cells um, for characterization and, and 
um, and further further experiments. Um, we needed to show that these cells in mice would be able to make human muscle fibers, which they made. They also made new PAC7 positive cells, so meaning muscle stem cells, in the regular niche, as is shown here. And we also can, can show that these satellite cells that are here now in their niche in newly made muscle fibers, that these cells regenerate muscle even if this part of the transplant is injured again. So here we, we think that we have made cells, human cells, that have the full potential of, um, of stem cells and regenerating cells. And this has, has led to, to um, a technical innovation, so a new isolation and cultivation technique, um, where we um, prepare the, the fibers without any enzymes. And then there is another step. We, we um, sort of put the cells back into quiescence by a hypothermic interval, which lasts for a week, um, whereas there is nothing happening to the fibers. And we, we, when we transfer them then again to 37 degree to let them grow, we get very nice cell populations and only the muscle stem cells can survive this harsh treatment in the refrigerator. So we get 100% myogenic cells and these cells have a high regenerative potential. This has been published and there is also a patent that has been now accepted by the EU. Now, is this now something that would, would be good enough as a basis for, for um, treatment development? And I think uh, without the BIH around and without having these, these um, wonderful atmosphere in, in Berlin that, that sort of supports um, adventurous thoughts, um, I think we probably would have left it with our nice papers and, and went to the next project. But now the, the destiny was different and we looked into the, the topic of advanced therapy medicinal products, ATMPs, and um, we realized that this is a young and a growing market and that cell therapies, well, as you know, have been around as an important topic for many years. However, not all of this was, was successful in the first attempts. And the first approved ATMPs, they were not successful in the EU market. And one of the very important parts was the pricing of course, the competition. The newer ATMPs that are in the market, they are primarily targeting rare diseases and with an orphan designation. And this is probably, um, well, this is the way we think we should, we should go as well. And um, there is much, much more interest now recently in this, in this whole field. And um, the BIH has been very aware of this. So we came up and said, okay, let's let's go for it and let's try it. And we, this is our concept of how we want to develop treatments for muscular dystrophies. So we have the cell product that I that I showed you, um, characterized this in in much much more detail than than I showed you, and uh, we can we can expand these cells and we can find. Um, um, disorders and indications for these cells where further manipulation apart from expanding them is not required. So this, this would be diseases where small muscles are just simply not, not functional. This could be at the urethral sphincter, this could be swallowing muscles in the throat. There are quite a few examples that could be, that could be given here. And so these cells would be expanded in, in vitro. And then eventually after they had been transformed into an ATMP, these cells can be transplanted back into a patient. In a patient with genetic muscular dystrophy, the story is not that simple, although this nothing in this story is simple however it's even more difficult and so we have a genetic um, muscle disease so we take the cells and the cells need to be genetically corrected before we can even think of a procedure to bringing them back to the patient in the black circle here we are really in the in the um, process of starting the first clinical trial using human muscle stem cells as an as an ATMP and as you can see in this drawing this we chose a pediatric orphan indication and the indication is called epispadia the problem is that um, it affects mostly boys and um, the problem is that there is a lifelong incontinence in these in these patients and uh, there is a proof of concept that um, 
um, um, reconstituting the urethral sphincter with this primary human muscle cells could be of, of very um, um, convincing um, therapeutic benefit. And this has been shown by Professor Kadavtsadi and published about 10 years ago. However, the, the, the design was uncontrolled of this of this little clinical trial um, he showed and, and the cells were not well characterized. So, so nobody really knows what was injected. Um, but we thought, okay, here we have an orphan disease, although it's pediatric and this of course um, creates, creates um, a lot of concerns um, how, when safety is, is um, considered. Um, but we, we are heading now for um, a randomized controlled clinical trial where um, in an autologous in autologous way and um, as I said without the BIH and the SPARC program we would never ever be able to start a clinical trial like this um, the trial will start um, from uh, financed by the uh, Ministry for, for um, Science and Education um, now in May and the first patient will be included into the patient by the end of this year or beginning of next year. We will have ended the trial as it's planned to at 2.25. Okay, the, the title of the talk was about gene edited cells, so I didn't speak too long about the Epispadia, although this would be a talk by itself. Um, now I would like to come to the red circle, which includes the um, gene editing um, attempt. Um, when, it, when gene therapies are mentioned, um, you are all aware of the fact that all kinds of things are included into this term. And um, there is the um, interference with the splicing procedure, um, which is also called, which is called gene therapy, where you um, where you mask certain splice sites, or there's also a, a mechanism called stop code and read through, um, where certain splicing products and those including a mutation are not are not um, built anymore um, after interference, and this um, this is an effective therapy, for instance, in the motor neuron disease, spinal muscular atrophy, which is on the verge of becoming a treatable disorder. The other, the other um, um, method that where gene therapy is, is nowadays um, used is the additional cDNA copy of a mutated um, of a mutated gene. So here, under the control of a of a, of a um, um, active promoter, a cDNA molecule is included and and um, put into an AAV virus, and this is then added to to the cells. And um, this this attempt of gene therapy um, is, for instance, um, already in in clinical trials um, by the Sarepta Therapeutic Company, and um, they they. Um, um, have tried um, the beta sarcoglycan gene and um, packed this into this into this um, AV virus under the promoter control. Um, I mentioned in my in my introduction that the AV mediated um, mediated therapy is still quite dangerous and the and the dose you need to give to reach to reach all the hundreds of skeletal muscles is quite high and the AAV has a tropism for for um, for the liver and so liver failure is the has been the the cause of the death in these children the other problem with AAV mediated cDNA copies of course is that um, AV only only tolerates a very small piece of, of um, DNA to be um, packed into the virus um, it also it also um, needs to be needs to be repeated probably um, these um, these transfers are not are not um, are not um, permanent so the the um, the advantage that the new CRISPR technology is giving now is the precise correction of a given mutation, so that the mutation just disappears from from the genome. So here um, we I'm showing you an example of a family um, where where two children are suffering from alpha sarcoglycan glycanopathy. Um, these children they showed first symptoms when they were seven or eight years. 
and um, they um, the older the older um, child is now wheelchair bound. Uh, the sister is not not wheelchair bound yet. There is no cardiac involvement. And these um, these children they carry a compound heterozygous mutation, meaning that they have two different um, mutations on each allele. And one of the first mutation is in exon two. It's a 157G2A mutation, and the other mutation is on exon seven. So when we decided to uh, to um, work to work on this um, on this mutation um, knowing that there are so many other possibilities and projects where we can work on so there must be some sort of a rational to do so and one of them uh, would be a very um, near question that almost everybody is asking is this a private mutation so are there any other patients who would who would carry this if you go into a large project of, of gene correction and um, well yes indeed there is and both mutations had been previously reported, and um, here these are the these are the um, citations. So the, when alpha sacroglycan was even dif discovered in the first paper in Nature Genetics in 1995, the exon7 mutation was was shown. The um, the mutation, the exon2 mutation, was thought back then to be a missense mutation, um, whereas the other one. <coughs> caused apparent splicing. In apparent splicing, um, it's quite clear that there might not be a protein expression of, um, and here this um, this patient is completely negative for alpha sacroglycan, which was back then called atalian. But for a missense mutant, um, it's not that clear that there would not be any protein expression whatsoever in the uh, when you stain here for the alpha sacroglycan. So this was a bit curious and um, Helena Escobar, who was working on the on the project, she she thought this was uh, funny. So let's check the mRNA first. Oh. Let's check the mRNA, sorry. <clears throat> but for that, to, to check this, we, we needed the muscle biopsy and we also needed to, to um, see whether we can, um, taking, our, taking our culture methods, even get nice, nice muscle cells from, these, from this patient. Because as I showed you in the beginning, these muscles tend to become fatty and connective tissue. And when we established our nice method to, to get muscle stem cells, we had no idea in the beginning whether muscle from these patients also would yield um, pure myoblasts. Um, but indeed, this method is quite robust. It's um, and we were able to to um, to get pure 95% pure myoblasts from these patients, and we characterized these pa these myoblasts by myogenic markers and ma made sure that the cells were still able to, to proliferate by this um, Chi67 marker and check that the, all the mutations are still present, and they were. And then we checked the mRNA. Um, and we saw that um, this this exon two um, mutation is by no way a missense mutant, but it's also an, a splice site mutation, and it's an exonic splicing defect. And here you can you can see the chromatograms um, that show this, and many more experiments have been done um, to to support these findings. Now. Even if we are able to to get these um, nice primary muscle stem cell cultures, um, of course these cells are still limited. And we, when, when we are trying to establish new methods of how to do gene correction, we cannot just use up all the cells that we have. And then once we are done, there are no cells left that might be really useful for translation. So then it, it really is of, of big help that we can use, or that we can make um, IPS cells and um, also the BIH with um, Harald Stachelscheid and Sebastian Dieke has um, has been very supportive here to to help us to make a patient IPS cells. And for us, we are not so much thinking about therapy when we make these cells, but to establish new gene editing methods. And so we um, we made um, these iPS cells, and they were expressing all the necessary markers. And we showed that that they make all the necessary tumors um, from all, all germ layers, and that um, in all these these mutational events that are going on in this rapid proliferation, that the mutations were still present, and they were. So we have here a tool of unlimited cells where we could establish um, um, several several gene correction methods.
Um, and we wanted to work with the CRISPR-Cas system. I'm sure that I don't have to go into detail on this. You're probably all aware um, what this means. So we have the, um, the Cas9 and um, with the help of a, of a guide sequence of uh, 20 base pairs, um, the, the Cas9 nuclease can, um, can target a, with very, very high precision a certain um, sequence in the, in the genome and then um, induce a double DNA double-strand break. And um, then it's up to the cell to repair this double-strand break either by non-homologous end joining or by <clears throat> homology-directed repair. So these, these, are, um, these are mechanisms that the cell is able to, um, to provide. And um, in the term of gene repair, we have also worked on both of these, of these mechanisms. But I want to, to move on and um, give you an example of another, um, another advance that has been made um, on the basis of the CRISPR-Cas9 system. And that is the adenine base editing. Um, and what what is um, this has been published in by the end of 2017 and the difference to classical um, CRISPR Cas9 is that the Cas9 is not a nuclease anymore but induces a, a single strand NIC so it's a dead Cas9 and um, there is an addition of the enzyme TED A and in, with the addition of this of this enzyme. There is, um, there is no double strand break induced, but instead there is adenosine <clears throat> exchanged into inosine, and then it reads in the next, in the next cycle as, um, as a um, guanine. So here um, you can have a very precise um, A to G conversion um, without, um, without um, inducing a double strand break, uh, where the repair has, is also quite prone for for mistakes or for inefficiency. Um, so it turned out um, that, that the um, mutation, the exon 2 mutation of our family, um, that this would be an ideal candidate for, for the adenine base editor. Um, so the, for the adenine base editor to work, um, it does need quite, quite a few requirements. Um, and I, I always um, have to smile a bit when I read this Gaudelli paper and I see that in the introduction, uh, the authors claim that about 50% of the, of the uh, mutations that are disease causing um, would be candidates for the, um, for the adenine base editor um, because, because it's so frequent. But when, we, when you look at it closely, the number of eligible mutations really diminishes rapidly. Um, so you do have, um, you, you have a PAM sequence, um, a prototype adjacent motif, that is sort of the anchor where, from where the, the um, guide RNA is, is um, attached to the, to the DNA. And this is an NGG, here it's an AGG. And then there is a certain distance to the ABE, and in base editor activity window. And in the activity window, which is quite small, here only with five nucleotides, there is a single A, and it can only be a single A. If there's more than one A, the other A will also be uh, become edited. Um, so it has to be a single A without any adjacent um, other A's, and you do have to have the pump sequence in exactly um, in the right distance. Um, so we try here. This was a very um, um, a very good candidate for the adenine base editor, and um, um, Helena Escobar um, tried to clone clone the plasmid, and then um, the first attempt was to. Um, try to, to um, edit the patient iPS cells. As a reporter in the plasmid, um, we used a Venus and the transfected cells were fax sorted before, <clears throat> before editing. And you can, you can see here um, that um, the adenine base editor in the iPS cells, um, they repair the mutation. Here we have this compound heterozygous state, 50% for each um, for the G and for the A, and um, after after editing, um, the, um, the the percentage of of G um, rose to 71 percent, and A diminished. <clears throat> this was um, this was quite nice and very promising. So here we have al almost double 
of the of the um, of of the G's, um, and and we turn to the to the primary cells, which have not been um, gene corrected at all by anybody anywhere, and we were quite interested to see whether this would work um, in the in the primary cells as well. And as you can see here in the chromatograms, here we have the um, compound heterozygous state in the experiment without the gRNA. Um, and when we added the gRNA, um, the amount of, of G rose to 100%. And this was confirmed by deep sequencing and, and um, clonal analysis. So we have a almost 100%, I think it's 98% um, percent repair. And this is um, in, in this gene editing field is um, something um, very um, very nice to have these um, these high high efficiency. Um, the experimental setup was was basically the same as with the iPS cells, um, and then there was a careful off-target analysis, meaning are there other sites where the uh, where the base editor might also have had some influence on the on the gene sequence. And um, this was quite safe, so there was no editing of the predicted. Um, of target site, so we we really could be could be quite quite happy about this. Now you have these cells, but and you did all this manipulation with fact sorting and transfection, and and we were wondering whether these cells are are still okay, whether they would still do anything, or whether all editing only only would would yield um, dead or almost almost dead cells. But these cells were quite happy, and um, as you can see here on the in the upper corner. Um, when you um, when you change the um, the con growth conditions, they um, happily fused into myotubes, and the staining for alpha sarcoglycan, which is here in green, um, in the control myotubes, and which is completely absent in the patient myotube, um, um, was expressed again here in this 157G rep rep for repair as we call these cells now. So in vitro these cells are doing nicely um, and, and they can, can do everything that our cells are able to do in vitro. Um, then we went into into an animal into animals in immuno without immuno um, sorry um, immunosuppressed animals um, that lack an immune system NGS mice. NSG mice, and these NSG mice um, uh, got transplanted with these um, 157G rep cells, um, and you can see that human muscle fibers are made, and um, quite quite a few of them. And this is this is a, a proof that that the corrected cells um, have can can uh, can have a function, and they can can build um, muscle muscle fibers. And very interestingly, we also we needed to check whether these cells also would would make new muscle stem cells in their anatomical niche, because for any for any regeneration that might happen later after transplantation, you do need these these um, satellite cells again. And um, yes, these Pac7 positive satellite cells in their anatomical niche were found in these transplants and um, gave us uh, quite some realistic hope that um, these transplantations might might be clinically useful at some point in the future. Okay, so so now now I could stop and I could say, yes, is this it? Are we there? Um, well, not quite. And I think this is important. So, of course, you would all say this is real translation because we are working with patient material and we have shown that um, this patient material can indeed be corrected and, and that um, we now have cells that do not carry this disease-causing mutation anymore. But no, we are not there because now the translation starts, the true translation. We cannot use these cells and just give them back to the patient. Why is this? Well, first of all, because these cells have been um, worked on and, and uh, modulated in a scientific environment, and of course, it's completely forbidden to, to take these cells now. So you do need a GMP, a good manufacturing practice environment, to, to manufacture the cells that ultimately should be given back to the patient here to close this very important last quarter of our nice circle. 
Um, also, you obviously you cannot you cannot um, work with a venous reporter in in patient cells, and in the um, and plasmids. If you work with plasmid on a plasmid basis, then there is um, the um, there is always a danger that a plasmid would um, would be um, 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 included into the into the DNA and um, would be randomly integrated, which might might cause harm. The plasmid also could be um, degraded in the cytoplasm, um, but you have no control over the time in which this may happen. And here we are not talking about an additional copy of a gene. Here we are talking about a potential gene scissor, um, and you just do not want to have this molecule around for too long. So there are different possibilities that we thought of what, what could we do to, to um, get the um, base editor into our primary cells and let it only stay there for a very short time and then hopefully to let the cell machinery uh, degrade, degrade the base editor um, right away. So obviously there are two possibilities. One could add the base editor as a protein and you could add the base editor as an mRNA molecule. And um, we, we tried both, but um, here I want to show you a little bit, a um, little, a little data on the on the mRNA attempt, and we we um, well this was this was new new to us, and we were um, didn't really know what to expect from um, from these experiments, and we started very simple with an mRNA molecule that encoded um, GFP. And here you can see in different um, mRNA concentrations um, that the cells um, do take up the mRNA quite nicely. The, these are primary muscle human stem cells, and uh, they take this up very nicely. And you can see here in these in these photos that um, the the brightness of of um, the signal appears to be quite even in in the in these in these cultures. As a control, we did the, what we always do: the transfection with the GFP plasmid. And here you can see that the intensity of the green varies from cell to cell, and the number of cells that are transfected also are quite lower. Here, in a quantification um, and um, on, and a summary of all the experiments that were done with these GFP mRNA. You can see that the plasmid control gives you some low signal and that the signal is quite uneven from cell to cell, summarized here in the in the um, in the first in the first um, part of the of the figure, um, and that the mRNA molecule gives you nicely defined peaks depending on the concentration of the mRNA or the amount of the mRNA that was added. So here we find that we can that mRNA can enter the primary muscle cell um, efficiently to 100% and um, also gives a very nice and even um, distribution with our first reporter molecule. And here we um, we also said, well, if this works, okay, now let's let's have a look whether we can we can um, take the base editor as an mRNA molecule and achieve editing in a way in the primary cells, um, as as was possible with the um, with the plasmid. And yes, indeed, there is there is editing happening with the mRNA molecule. So this is ongoing work, and we are quite excited about this because with the mRNA molecule and a GMP attempt, it might be possible to be to, to bring this in a safe way to the patient. And um, the mRNA, of course, has a limited half time and will, um, and will be degraded in, um, quite rapidly. But we also are creating data that support this. So this would be a truly translational workflow for gene-corrected primary muscle stem cells. So we have the families, we generate the primary human muscle stem cells, we do in vitro gene correction using an appropriate um, Cas9 molecule in our my example here, the base editor. Then we quantify the correction. We have to do um, detailed off-target analysis. Of course, we want to know whether these corrected cells are viable and functional, and we have to prove and did so that there is in vivo regenerative capacity. And then there is this important step of bringing this back to the patient. 
is this all well no you know we are we have ambitious aims and um so we we um think this is very nice still the therapeutic effect will be limited we are of course aware of this and um in parallel with the help of Ralf Kühn from the MDC we have um created mice that are chimeric human human um, humanized mice, um, where Ralph took out the mouse SGCA alpha sarcoglycan sequence and in, inserted the human sequence, so that now we can work with the same guide RNAs and the same a, a base editor as in the in the in the cells. We can use these same molecules in the um, in the mice and this is what we plan to do in the next years and hope that in this very nice mouse model that has a severe disease cause and really allows us um, several possibilities of outcome measures to um, work on the in vivo equivalent of what i showed you in vitro before and with this i would like to thank the group and thank all the supporters and i will show you the main players here so we have helena escobar who got the base editor to work in our lab um, we have verena who is developing the clinical trial on the uncorrected um, wild type cells we have christian who is now working on the mrna aspect we have eric who is our IPS expert, and we have all the help of all the other people, and we need all of them. So thank you very much for your attention, and I'm ready to take questions. Yeah, thank you very much, Simona, for a very clear, excellent, and clear presentation. Um, I think we've learned a lot. I've learned, definitely learned a lot. Um, I don't see any questions yet, but obviously, since people are getting ready to ask. I also have some questions. Um, with regard to the alpha um, sarcoglycan project, um, I understand correctly they, the patients have one wild type allele and one mutant allele, right? So no, they have two mutant alleles, but it's not the same. It's not homo. It's not homozygous. It's a compound heterozygous mutation. But but we we um, assume that correcting only one mutation high, with high efficiency, this okay. would bring the patient into the state of a carrier, and a carrier would be asymptomatic. So it doesn't. It's not a dominant negative effect of the mutant allele towards the the white allele. So, nope. um, so with regard to the mRNA, isn't that the same? The mRNA approach is the same approach as you use for the COVID nineteen vaccination, correct? Um, yeah, in a way. So, well, in a way, yes. Well, only that we are delivering the the base editor in the moment, and we also yeah, we we worked with other mRNAs of the uh, of the CRISPR family as well. Um, yeah, but it's it's from from the the biology behind it. Yes, it's the same. So the, the same as, as BioNTech would use or, or Moderna is, is using, exactly. right? Exactly. And, yes. and you also have the muscle producing then, in that case, the immunizing agent, right? Yes. So 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 you you would basically follow a similar um, scheme, so to say, as we now see developing for for the coronavirus infection. <laughs> yes, uh, yes, yes. This is this is correct. And when we started um, using the mRNA and getting this to to work, um, there was no no talk yet about mRNA vaccination. So we did come up with it. Mm -hmm. So it's cool that it comes from different sides, right? So <laughs> positive. So we did, when when we had this clinical um, research unit at some point, we talked a lot about myostatin and myostatin fully statin. Myostatin being a, a a molecule which blocks muscle growth, so to say, right? And one yeah. idea was that you can interfere with the myostatin, and you would get back muscle growth if there is muscle growth. Is, has anything developed along those lines? I mean, with polystatin being an antagonist of myostatin or something like this, is anything uh, approaching in, in that direction as well? 
The, um, there have been a couple of clinical trials using a myostatin blockade, and um, some of them are still going on. But um, it, it has been clear when we discussed this about 10 years ago that it really does not make a lot of sense to let diseased muscle just grow. And if you have a dystrophic muscle and, and let it explode into a large dystrophic muscle, there is not a lot to be gained. Um, in the combination with gene correction, um, myostatin um, blockade might again play some role to help the uh, repaired muscle to, to gain some size. But I'm really not sure about it. And maybe maybe one should leave uh, uh, leave uh, myostatin out but i'm not sure maybe there will be a, a great role one in the future so, so this original idea that myostatin might be the way to go is is really it's more complicated than than that i mean we anticipated that already but um i just wanted to make there are a couple of yes. questions now um about the mouse model established by ralph Kuhn. Um, does it harbor a homozygous version of the one mutation that it is, is targeted by A2G editing or also the compound heterozygosity from the patient? Well, um, I, I, well, sure, for time reasons, I didn't um, tell you about this in too, too detail. Ralf not only made one strain, but he made four. So he has um, established one with a wild type um, um, human alpha sarcoglycan sequence, another one um, with the, um, with the um, exon 2 mutation, a third one with the exon 7 mutation, and a fourth one where the alpha sarcoglycan is completely knocked out. And now we do have characterized all these strains, and they are really nice. And with the, um, and now we can do we can we have homozygous mutations and we can also cross the two exon two exon seven mutation we can back cross them and then we have um, compound heterozygous mice as well um, so i think this is a very nice and versatile model that was a question by uh, michael landsbach there's another question from n schulke um very nice talk um, how many corrected cells would you need to fully treat a patient? Yeah, many, no? um, many cells. And fully treat a patient would mean very much, very many cells. And um, this is um, not, we don't have an, an indefinite cell number yet. Um, the cells that we can manufacture in the moment and that we can use for for a treatment um, attempt would be um, would be sufficient um, for a small muscle to reconstitute a small muscle. Small muscle could be um, the muscle that is responsible to to for finger grip and for finger flexor, which also is a nice muscle to have if you are able to to hold your cup or your toothbrush. Um, and and but we will we will be modest um, with the cell numbers that we have. However, there are many thoughts about. Um, increasing the cell numbers, um, getting other cell types um, to become muscle cells from IPS attempts, you probably all heard. Um, yeah, so so um, this is not the end of the of 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 what can be possible. So to follow up on this, if you really want to treat a patient who has problems in all of her or his muscles, would you go into every muscle once or would you I mean what how you envision this I mean if you really have a, a problem with the whole skeletal muscle system um, so if there is an unlimited cell number um, and we don't um, then there would be there would be possibilities and there are devices that would do this um, you would you would sort of inject uh, large muscles um, in a distance from let's say one centimeter Okay. There would be an injection of a defined cell number, and um, there are there are um, there there are devices that allow the parallel injection um, to many many different spots um, from other operations that are done on the skin and things like this. So there would be a technical possibility to do many injections in many many different muscles. But here the cell number, of course, is the limitation. So we have a question by Robin Graf, um, very clear talk. 
you mentioned that there was no off-targeted edit editing. Is this because the SG RNA is very specific or where off-targets potentially edited below detection limits? Um, well, um, Helena Escobar did the did a careful um, analysis on on these off targets, and there were there was was a bystander edit below 0.3 percent. So this was um, this was hardly detectable, but it was there, and um, we find this negligible. negligible. Um, but this also, at least when it comes to comes to the um, really translation and putting these cells back into patients, we are in discussion with the Paul Ehrlich Institute on, on you know, what can be tolerated. But I honestly cannot say why there is um, such a low um, off-target, um, why there are, so, probably it's the, it's the specificity of, um, of, the, of the guide plus the relative in, um, well, the, the, the possibility that the base editor is just not recognizing um, so many so many sites, but this might be nonsense. I'm 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 re taking this back. <laughs> okay, I think as there are no more questions and we are already past the hour mark, um, uh, I thank you again for a very clear and nice presentation. I'm sure that there are more questions and um, people can email you, I guess. Yes, they, please please contact me if there's anything you would like to know in addition. Visit the website of Simona, uh, watch, the, watch the video. It's really uh, worthwhile to see the BIH video on inspiring women. Um, we need a lot of women in leading scientists places. I think it is really, really important. And we as a GSCM try to always push forward and the BIH as well. Um, that leaves me, uh, the next BIH lecture will be coming up at um, Friday, May the 28th, again at 12 o'clock. And we will hear a presentation by uh, Masayo Takahashi from the Ritten Center for Developmental Biology in Japan, which um, she is very much working on um, uh, fixing the, the retina by IPS cells. So we will uh, go pretty much in similar directions as we have seen today. And I'm, I'm very happy that we can follow this up with the, with the talk um, here then from Japan on the 28th of May. And without this and with finishing this, I'd like to thank you for your attention and hopefully uh, see you within the next BIH lectures.